background is I'm a lawyer. I used to practice municipal law. I was the assistant city council in the state. And then I opened up my own practice in Toronto. And then I had one of these, oh my goodness, climate change sorts of moments. And so I launched this uh, national non for profit organization. Uh, so um, I'm going to show just one slide on climate change, just sort of, so we're sort of all on the same page. And then I'll segue into uh, my proposal for sort of addressing climate in action. Um, oh, is this on time? Sure, I'm no. Yeah. I would be very gentle. Do you want to go backwards? No, uh, you can use this. Can I use this? Yes. Is that better? Yeah. All right, this is what I'll do. Thank you. Um, so it was in 2009 that the world got together in Copenhagen uh, for the United Nations Climate Change Conference. And one of the things that came out of that was this political consensus uh, that the Earth, we can't go over a temperature increase of more than two degrees Celsius as measured since uh, the Industrial Revolution. So of course, we burn fossil fuels, that emits greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, of course, then that causes warming and there's this increase in temperature. So this is now the political consensus. We've effectively set the ceiling on temperature increase. Working backwards from that, scientists ask the question, well, how much more fossil fuels can we burn? So how much more CO2 can we emit before we commit to a temperature increase of two degrees Celsius? And the figure they came up with was 565 gigatons worth of carbon dioxide. And I won't ask you to remember these numbers, but just the takeaway is more conceptual. If you create a, a ceiling for temperature increase working backwards from that, then you're, you're creating what is in effect now people are calling carbon budget. Uh, the last figure on the series that I'll show you comes from a group of financial analysts out of the United Kingdom. They asked the question, well, we know how much we can burn until we reach that two degrees Celsius figure. But how much is there left to burn? And to approximate that figure, uh, what they did is they looked at um, annual reports of publicly traded companies that deal in fossil fuels. They looked at their assets where they list the proven reserves. So the amount of coal, oil, natural gas that they've identified as being under the earth that they intend on extracting and, and bringing to market for us to use in a variety of ways. And so they added all of those reports together. They added Shell's report and Exxon's report and so on to get a sense of global proven reserves. And the figure they came up with is 2,795 gigatons worth of carbon dioxide, roughly five times the amount that brings us to this dangerous threshold. Um, so what are people saying about this? Uh, you get Barack Obama, who was recently quoted as having said, we're not going to be able to burn at all. I very much believe in keeping that two degree Celsius target as a goal. Uh, you also have our very own Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of Canada, economist, now governor of the Bank of England, who said, the vast majority of reserves are unburnable. One should think of them as stranded assets. So we find ourselves at this point in time where we've benefited civilization in many, many ways, care of our use of fossil fuels, but we're learning more and more that this is coming at a cost and it's not sustainable. And there are a lot of people and groups that are working on solutions, places we can transition to clean technology, use fossil fuels in more conservative ways and so on. I think our challenge really is though, uh, not so much climate change, but rather inaction on climate change, how to address that. There's a lot of sort of systemic inertia to the status quo. And what I'm suggesting that we do is we sort of engage people in such a way that causes a little more dissatisfaction with status quo solutions. That then facilitates the transition to something more sustainable. Uh, to that end, I'm suggesting that communities across Canada, indeed the world, uh, actually implement uh, or work together to require climate change and air pollution labels uh, on gas pumps. And we have a few series of designs that I'm happy to share with you, but I'm also wanting to work collaboratively with municipalities to create uh, designs. Um, since launching this organization in 2013, the idea has been endorsed by over 100 academics from universities and various uh, faculties all over North America. Uh, many profs here at the University of Guelph have endorsed this. There's also uh, some of the most prominent people that work on climate change, like James, ha James Hansen, for example, from NASA, has endorsed this concept uh, that came out of Toronto about two years ago. Um, and there's also all sorts of people from Harvard, Columbia, et cetera, that have endorsed it. The idea has been endorsed by the David Suzuki Foundation. We've been endorsed by the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, Cleaner Partnership, and so on. So it's really starting to get um, traction. I think part of that is because it's familiar. So a lot of people say, oh, this reminds me of the labels that we see on tobacco packages. So of course, you know, you smoke a cigarette today, down the road you get sick. The government has said, let's put some of those down the road consequences on the package today. Similarly, we burn fossil fuels today. Down the road, there are a variety of consequences. Wouldn't it be interesting if you could take some of those down the road consequences 
and put them on some of the things to dispense fossil fuels today. Uh, people ask me, do the warning labels on tobacco packages work? The answer is yes, they do. So in 2001, uh, Canada became the first jurisdiction in the world to require the visual, the pictorial warning labels on tobacco packages. Since then, something like 50 to 60 countries have adopted our innovation. So there's a real interesting story of leadership embedded in that. Uh, more to the point, though, uh, something there's like 200 independent studies from countries all over the world that all seek to answer the question, do these things work? Uh, in 2009, the European Union commissioned a meta-study, so a study of studies, uh, that looked at all these studies and concluded that yes, these things help to change two things. One, attitude, and two, behavior. So shifts in behavior are important, but shifts in attitude also enables so much more. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more about that, but I'm trying to keep it within the 25 uh, minute time frame and allow for some questions, but feel free to ask me about that if you like. Um, having said that though, I think this idea is particularly compelling when you consider it in the context of climate change. And a few reasons um, are this. So I like to say, Climate change can be understood as a problem of no feedback. And what I mean by that is, there's a delay between cause and effect. So we burn fossil fuels today, the consequences of which aren't experienced until down the road. There's no feedback. Unlike, for example, if I put my hand on a hot stove, there's this instant feedback, this pain signal, my adaptive behavior is I'm, I'm removing my hand from the hot stove. Uh, in this example, there's no feedback. And in the absence of feedback, we fall prey to our cognitive biases one of which is called uh, the current moment bias, or hyperbolic discounting. And it's this tendency to prefer interests that are small and near in time, relative to those that are significant, but far down the road. It's why we procrastinate. Um, what this idea does, quite simply, is it counteracts the current moment bias just by, by building feedback. So by bringing that faraway consequence into the here and now, using, using text and image. So it actually addresses it takes a problem with no feedback and it builds feedback. It addresses one of sort of the aspects of climate change, why it's, it's hard for us to collectively address, uh, and it addresses an aspect of human nature in this simple, low-cost approach. Um, interestingly, Mark Carney calls this the tragedy of horizons, uh, which is the tendency of market actors to look only to the near term uh, and not the future, is what he says. Think about how if you can bring future consequences into the here and now, how that might affect market actors. Uh, Barack Obama was recently quoted as having said, one of the hardest things in politics is getting a democracy to deal with something now where the payoff is long-term or the price of an action is decades away. So imagine if you can bring the price of an action much, much closer into the now, how that then enables a politician to address this. So I think you'll see ramifications both in the business world and in government, and I'll go into that in a bit. Um, I like to also say that climate change can be understood as a problem of diffusion of responsibility. Uh, so what I mean by that is, is I admit a little bit, I contribute a little bit to the problem. Chris admits a little bit, contributed a bit to the problem as well, so does Josh. As individuals, our contribution to the problem, of course, is small. Collectively, though, our actions are altering the chemistry of our planet. Social psychologists know, and they see this play out time and time again in a variety of scenarios, when responsibility for something is diffuse, so when it's shared among many, we're actually less likely to act. Uh, and the fix is fairly simple. For those of you that have ever taken a CPR course, you'll know that if you're administering CPR, you don't say, somebody, somebody, anybody, please call 911. You say you, and we're making eye contact. You call 911 and get back to me when you do, because we know that intervention in the latter will occur, in the former it won't. Um, and what this idea does quite simply is the placement of the warning label on the gas pump nozzle, it takes a problem of diffuse origins and quite literally locates responsibility right in the palm of your hand. So again, this simple low cost sticker actually addresses an aspect of climate change, addresses an aspect of human nature. And I challenge you to think of both in these two examples, anything out there like it that connects us to this problem in quite a direct way. There's actually nothing out there like it. So this truly is a revolutionary intervention. Uh, the last piece, so it takes a problem, diffuse origins, and locates responsibility. The last piece uh, is a concept from economics called externalities, and I find the best way to explain this is just to, to go by way of an example. So let's say uh, a liter of gasoline costs $1.35. You know this is an old slide because now the price is a bit lower, right? Uh, but let's say this is what you see at the pump. Um, we know that sort of that's the, the signal of, of the price of the worth, the value of the product to the marketplace. Um, and there's a variety of, of things in that that help inform price. So 
the producer, they had to pay uh, labor to sort of extract the stuff uh, from a field somewhere, say. That's, that's a cost reflecting that $1.35. Um, there, of course, were some machines that had to be paid for in that process. Some energy was expended during that. The product had to be shipped somewhere. It had to be refined, brought to an individual retailer, so the costs go higher and higher. Um, of course, there's a profit margin, and there's taxes on top of that. So all of those help to inform that $1.35 price uh, to the consumer. Economists, though, know that there are a variety of externalities or external costs, hidden costs associated with the use of the product. So we burn fossil fuels. That causes climate change, causes warming, causes a melt in glaciers, necessitates then communities to spend billions of dollars to adapt their coastal infrastructure to this rise in sea level. That's a cost that is actually borne by us collectively down the road. Economists say, well, we need to bring that cost you know, reflected in the price of the product that's actually causing the harm. That's sort of some of the thinking behind um, ways to price carbon, like a cap-and-trade regime or a carbon tax. So we know there are some external costs, uh, like upgrades to coastal infrastructure. Uh, if it's harder to grow food in drought-stricken areas, there's a hit to agriculture. You might see uh, property damage. That's another cost, uh, impacts to health care, and so on. So the costs go higher and higher. By internalizing those costs uh, through some mechanism of pricing carbon, you're basically communicating the true price of that product to the marketplace. You're then sort of shifting interest to less costly solutions. The challenge is, you know, it's one thing to price the concrete and rebar that goes into upgrading your coastal infrastructure, but how on earth do you price the value of the species? What is the dollar value of human life even if, if we're to be impacted by this problem? And I ask myself, what if there's another way to capture and communicate externalities to the marketplace? Of course, there is. So, what the idea, this sort of pricing approach, tries to achieve using this quantitative language, sort of the use of dollars and cents, our idea achieves using this qualitative language, so through the use of image and text. In the abstract, they're doing the same thing. They're both communicating externalities to the marketplace. On the ground, though, I think uh, this idea on the right has the potential to engage our sense of humanity in a way that a five cent increase at the pumps never will. And I like to ground this in a study. Oh, so it takes a problem of externalities and communicates them. Uh, I like to ground this in a study that came out of a, a bunch of daycares in Israel where um, parents were coming late to pick up their kids at these daycares. And so the external cost to that was, of course, uh, the person that runs the daycare, they're having to change their social, social schedule, they're pushing back dinner plans and so on. So it's outside of you know, that weekly payment that they've contracted to. There's this external cost right, that's not being covered. So economists said, let's price that harm. So for every, every minute you're late, say you owe the daycare a dollar, you're late a half hour, you owe the daycare $30 and so on. So traditional economic thinking suggests you now incentivize people to come earlier. Uh, what ended up happening, actually, though, is people came later, and behavioral economists observed that sometimes when pricing externalities, you actually shut off sort of this moral cue that regulates human behavior because the thinking changes. It's, oh, I don't feel that sort of sense of, of accountability to a fellow human being that I should be there on time. It's, oh, I can afford that. I'll send that one last email at work. I'll be there a little bit later. So it's, there's a lot of interesting research from this realm that suggests ways of communicating it using these sorts of tools might actually be more compelling. Um, and I'll also suggest to you, and this is sort of Economics 101, when it comes to the price of gasoline, demand response to changes in price of gasoline is actually fairly inelastic. What that means is price goes up five cents, goes down five cents, we're still consuming the same amount of product. I still need to get from A to B, right? We might grumble about the price of gas. It's not actually causing much behavioral change. I think this idea, what it uh, what it has the potential to do is sort of get us to ask that question: What are my options? What am I supposed to What am I supposed to do? That's in a place uh, for change. Uh, one last bit uh, from communications theory. So Marshall McLuhan, of course, a famous communications theorist, uh, famously said, "The medium is the message." So people sometimes tell me, "Well, Rob, I've learned about climate change. I saw it, you know, in a documentary. I read about it in a book, in an article, and so on." If you think about this, if you apply McLuhan's The Medium is the Message to how we traditionally read this information, you know, that movie that I saw, I'm the medium being the message, so I'm sort of distant, I'm removed from that, I'm, I'm this observer, say, did it with that article that I'm reading, and so on. What this idea does, you know, the medium 
being the message, the gas pump nozzle is the medium, it is the message. I may have actually read the content of this label before, but I'm actually moving from passive observer literally to active participant. And there's nothing, again, like this out there. And if you can engage people in this way, you know, it, it shapes the form of human association. If you can engage people in this way, it creates greater collective impetus to address the problem. I also like to point out the people that watch climate change documentaries and read climate change books aren't the people that need to watch climate change documentaries and read climate change books. So think about it, how it also controls the scale, right? So that's interesting. You're accessing sort of a different constituency. Uh, what do I think will actually happen? So the story I'd like to tell real quick, uh, it was sort of an experiment that I ran on my mom. It was several months ago, and uh, we were showing up, I was showing up at her place for breakfast. Um, here's my mom thinking, oh, what a wonderful boy, he's spending more time with me nowadays. But it was just this experiment I was running on her. I was trying to catch her on a morning when her fuel gauge is close to empty, right? Go for breakfast together maybe three times. I see her gauge is close to empty, so I say, hey, I'm such a wonderful son, how about we hang out for dinner again? She's like, oh, Rob, you're such a lovely boy. Um, anyway, so the experiment goes on. I show up at her place in the evening. Uh, before I go in, I check her fuel gauge, and it's close to full. So I know that she gassed up during the course of the day, right? And so I ask her, how was your day? Where all did you go today? And she says, oh, my day was great. I, I went to work, I got groceries, and I came home. I said, where else did you go? Think about your day hard. Did you even stop for anything, anything else? Same story, work, groceries, home. Did you stop for a second? Did you stop your car, get out of your car for anything? Think hard, same story, right? Questions get narrow and narrower. Eventually, I ask her, by chance, did you stop at a gas station? And she pauses and says, uh, yeah, I did, why? And so downstream, if you think about it, the simple act of gassing up has been normalized for generations. It's so automatic, habitual, that it actually doesn't even register as an activity, as something that we do. If that's the situation downstream, if markets are so complacent that this doesn't even register as a thing that we do, how on earth are we to address this problem? Um, so the thinking, quite simply, is you'll see sort of an individual response and a collective response. So the individual response, quite simply, if I'm already concerned about this issue, I now feel engaged in, it in a way that heretofore I have not. So all of a sudden the problem's closer, all of a sudden you know, I feel a bit more responsible for it, all of a sudden we're taking these hidden costs, making them visible, I'm receiving that communication in a unique way. That could be the nudge that I need to maybe take public transit, uh, maybe consider riding my bike to work, maybe carpool. Whatever the individual behavioral change is, for many people that might nudge them to that. I'm more interested though in how does this affect the collective conversation on the issue? So again, the analog to the tobacco example, change in behavior, change in attitudes. How does this affect the collective conversation in such a way that enables all sorts of other action on the issue? So if there I am at the pump, where this activity that I used to engage in didn't even register as an activity, so automatic, just part of the everyday fabric of, of sort of living, um, if this thing becomes an activity and I say, well, what are my options? What am I supposed to do? You've kind of won. You've basically shaken up market complacency. You've created a bit of sense of dissatisfaction with the status quo. The flip side of that is you're stimulating broader demand for alternatives. In having people ask that question, you create space for change. So on the collective piece, I think one, from the government response end, uh, you'll then see a politician with more political license, more political capital to perhaps suggest funding for public transit. Everybody loves public transit. Conversation breaks down on funding this might make that a little more politically palatable. Um, or whatever the solution is, this creates more political space for it. Uh, on the business side of things, uh, you know, auto manufacturers, Ford, General Motors, and so on, they've basically been delivering the same solution to market for about a century, internal combustion engine. And what incentive do they have to change to invest you know, in R&D, spend money retooling their plant, retraining their employees, really incur a lot of costs to deliver some other product to market when guess what? We've been buying the same old thing for a long, long time. Why take that risk when the same old product sells? So by creating a bit of dissatisfaction in the marketplace with the existing solution, you're stimulating demand for alternatives. That then means there's a segment that's not being catered to. If I'm in that sector, that's the sound of money. I'm now incentivized to deliver some other solution to cater to the segment. If I don't, a competitor will. So it's a catalyst, uh, which is I think the expression that, that you use. It's a real catalyst for change. Uh, it's also one more piece. I was in a community, I added those two bullet points. They said, Rob, this was on the East Coast a couple weeks ago, 
and we're too conservative here, this will never fly. I'm like, guys, this is a conservative idea. It's market friendly, it's non prescriptive. If you think about it, this is just information. We're not telling anyone what to do. We're just providing markets, communities with relevant information, relying on markets to respond. So it's actually more of a right spectrum intervention. So I see the potential for sort of broad support, places with strong environmental values, and perhaps places with even more conservative uh, political leanings. Um, and just so you know, it's not just the story of my mom. This is from the leading uh, think tank in the, in the United Kingdom on behavioral economics. Psychologist theories on changing habits generally involve first on freezing the subconscious action and raising it to a conscious level where we can consider the merits of alternative behaviors. So again, places to transition to. First, what we need to do is sort of unfreeze challenge the status quo, loosen that grip, it's then easier to transition to these places, and that's the role that this piece plays. Um, well, let's see what we have here. So really, really quick, uh, above the line, 1908 Ford Model T, first mass-produced vehicle, uh, got between six and nine kilometers per liter. If you think of, and mind you, there's some, some more television <coughs> vehicles you know, than the one that I selected, but if you think about it, this sector has been stagnant when it comes to fuel economy, right? Above the line is what makes it to market, below the line is what doesn't. Every year, Shell hosts something called the Eco Marathon. They invite high school and university students to create the most fuel efficient vehicles they can. This is the most fuel efficient vehicle in the world. It runs on a hydrogen fuel cell, but that's sort of an equivalency calculation, but gets over 5,000 kilometers per liter. This, it's hilarious because it reminds me of the Oscar Mayer hot dog Wienermobile. It wasn't even the best in its category. Uh, in 2013, though, the, the, the car that won the gasoline prototype vehicle, uh, it got just under 3,000 kilometers per liter. Now, these vehicles, they're very low to the ground, they're very light, they're aerodynamic, uh, they might max out at 50 kilometers per hour, and I'm not suggesting that this is where we need to transition to. Of course, there's electric vehicles, uh, you know, you can spend money on buses, have one engine burning fuel that pulls 50 people as opposed to, you know, a car that burns fuel to pull one person maybe, right? So there's all sorts of places we can transition to. The takeaway is, right now, status quo, it's the extreme end of inefficiency. This is the extreme end of efficiency, but we can actually do better. You know, necessity being the mother of invention, all this idea does is it injects a little more necessity into the system, a little more impetus for us to act. Um, this, I think, is perhaps one of the most important slides. Uh, right now, if you think of the Canadian context, how are we to address it in climate change? A lot of people focus on, say, oil sands. There's a lot of movement on pipelines, a lot of movement on shipping, this sort of a thing. There's this tendency in the sector, both in activism and media, uh, to focus on these upstream aspects, right? Um, I think we do that in part because it's comfortable. Wouldn't it be nice if we just reflected that mirror upstream and we shame industry? If we reflect the mirror downstream, if we ask the simple question, how do we use the product? that might make us a little uncomfortable. So we prefer this upstream narrative. Of course, what I'm suggesting is a little bit of uncomfort is actually a good thing, because that's where change comes from. Complacent markets don't change. So what I'm suggesting we do, quite simply, is we ask that question. More to the point, though, if you are concerned about greenhouse gas emissions, this is a really important chart. So what you have here on the x-axis, this is called a, a well-to-wheel life cycle analysis. So well, uh, sort of point of extraction to wheel, point of use, with greenhouse gas emissions measured uh, on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you have a variety of sources of fuels. So um, let's compare Canadian oil sands, which we sometimes hear as being maybe three times as dirty or carbon intensive, uh, to regular crude, right? So the top one to Canadian conventional crude. And if you'll notice, closer to the point of extraction, yeah, it's roughly three times as intense when it comes to carbon emissions. You have to take it, of course, as a percentage of the overall product life cycle, and that's when you see, well, what is this blue stuff? Clearly, this is the vast you know, uh, uh, majority of emissions, uh, and it's actually from vehicle operation. We should know this intuitively. The problem isn't taking the stuff out of the ground. It's not moving it. It's combustion, it's lighting it on fire. That's where emissions come from. And while there's a lot of uh, risks and impacts with you know, the tar sands, with pipelines, and we should be concerned about that, if you are concerned about greenhouse gas emissions, though, we really need to start asking this question. Uh, perhaps more to the point, even if, by some magic, you know, we shut down the tar sands tomorrow, Stephen Harper got my petition, um, 
you know, look, this is what we save. This is what we're actually talking about. We still have to deal with this problem. So I'm suggesting we ask the question, how do we use fossil fuels? Because that's where we can really transform. Um, one last piece, how disconnected are we? This pump was common in the 20s and 30s. You would actually use a hand pump over here to bring gasoline out of a reservoir at a gas station, fill up this gas cylinder. You would see the product. You would have some sense of what you were consuming. It would then flow down this hose. You'd fill up your car. A week later, you show up, consume the thing again. You have some sense that this product must come from somewhere. And I keep on coming back from it. I must be burning it. We're so detached, we basically have no idea that in the belly of our vehicles right now is gasoline that was derived from oil that had to come from somewhere on the planet. So what I'm suggesting is we feel a bit more connected to the problem. That's the way of creating change. Um, we're asking cities and towns uh, to engage in this. I apologize, but when you type in Google, uh, Guelph City Hall, as <laughs> you can, and I just walked by, no, that's the courthouse. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, there are three ways to support the concept. So the first, uh, cities can pass this into law using their licensing powers, and on our website, I've written a 40-page legal report that explores that pathway. Of course, that does come with some legal risk, uh, and in chatting with politicians from coast to coast, they are concerned about that because you are inviting litigation. Nonetheless, though, that's one possible way to explore it. If a community has concerns about whether or not it has the jurisdiction to do it, but does want to pass it into law in their community, what they can do is they can just ask the province to amend the municipal act so that there's an enabling provision that's explicit that they can do this. The last piece, which is a, an update, and I'm finding that that's getting traction now coast to coast, a lot of communities are more comfortable with this, is to support West Vancouver's resolution. And what that is, uh, a few weeks ago when I was in BC, West Vancouver unanimously passed a resolution, this is just an excerpt from it, that all vendors of retail petroleum products in Canada be legislated to provide warning labels on all pump handles. That's a resolution that's going to be put forward at the Federation of Community Municipalities in June 2016, and at the Union of BC Municipalities later this year. So we're asking communities to support this because legally, financially, politically, there's little to no risk. It's just a statement saying we should have these. Of course, the more communities that then support this, you're ensuring a positive outcome at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. If that then passes at that level, the position of cities and towns across the country is we want this. You're then enabling politicians at a senior level of government to actually pursue this. They don't have to sort of wear that decision. Um, two minutes? Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, the ultimate game plan is this. These are all the places in the world that have warning labels on tobacco products. Um, this is analytics from our website. So an organization with no staff, no financial resources, this is what we're getting. We're getting traffic from all over the world. We're, believe it or not, this idea is now in a textbook in Australia and France. I get tweets from all over the world um, because people get this. We've been cognitively primed to get this idea. The thinking is much like we led the way with the warning labels on tobacco packages. I'm asking us, I'm asking Canadians to lead the way with this concept. And I do think then that it will be followed. Uh, the slide to end on is this. So the challenge as I see it again, as I mentioned, is inaction on climate change, not climate change itself. I think if humanity can feel a little closer to the problem, a little more responsible for it, if you can take these hidden costs and make them visible, that's the missing piece. That's actually what we need to address this problem. And if you think about it, I was couch surfing on the East Coast. I went to a washroom uh, in my host's uh, in, her, in her place. She had painted on her wall the difference between why and why not. So I spent an hour giving lectures across North America answering the why question. The why not is what I'll land on. If you think about it right now, we're actually on this planet, this tiny rock.